Okay, welcome everybody to your spiritual journey. This is Dr. Bob Dove, and this is the place and the space where we get down to heavy spiritual matters and light ones too. I just want to remind you that to keep us on the air and keep going for a long time, because we want to be here for you for a long time, uh, please like us, uh, subscribe if uh, you're watching on YouTube, uh, maybe even support us on Patreon. Today's guest uh, is someone I met in May at the Northeast Reiki Retreat, and this is the fourth in our four-part series uh, from interesting people from the Northeast Reiki Retreat. Sarah Soltau uh, found her way to Reiki and energy work in 2009 after a long career in education. She's originally from West Virginia, and she and her husband Fred lived in Phoenix, Arizona for about six years. In January 2020, they moved back east uh, and now reside on 15 acres of land just outside of Richmond, Virginia. Her journey to wholeness includes Reiki, crystals, and vibrational energy work, finding connection with healing the land around her. And a continuing exploration of the role of the facial system i.e. connective tissue in the body's ability to receive and transmit intuitive and healing energies. So in addition to those pursuits, she's also a fiber artist, uh, and she creates basketry with pine needles provided by a tree in her yard. And I've seen some of those baskets. Uh, Maybe you could just hold one up. Sarah, so sure. yeah, yeah. I know those listening won't be able to see it, but if if you're on YouTube, you can see how intricate and delicate they are, and those are just all pine needles. Yes, and, and a shell. A shell yeah. is the center, just a shell. <laughs> okay, clam oyster <laughs> off the beach. So yeah. Anyway, I found. Uh, Seeing those in person and being able to feel and touch them, uh, it's it's quite an experience. So, Sarah, I'm, I'm going to go back to our usual format. We can start with your childhood and your spiritual journey from childhood until now. You're up. Okay. All right. It's a, it's a long road, and, you know, I, I like to say that it's a very circuitous path. And it um, continues, and I'm happy about that, too. So I am from West Virginia, and uh, I, I would call it the civilized part of West Virginia. It was the area that was between, yeah, Maryland and um, Virginia, and then D.C. is about 60 miles away. But it's still, you know, it's just it was a small town and, and all of that. So, um Spiritually, I think I was always attracted. I know that I was always attracted to spirituality. Um, however, we went to church, Presbyterian, but, you know, it was just what it was. And um, I remember I have a couple of distinct memories that kind of formulated a, some of this pathway. One of them, I was about four years old, and I re- very distinctly remember being on the front porch of this house we had just moved into. And I remember looking at my hand and, and seeing a golden outline around my hand. And I remember at the age four going, well, I guess I won't be doing that anymore. And it was like, You know, nothing around me was any kind of like nurturing in terms of spirituality or inner resources. It was all like, you know, you go to school, you do this, you do that. And I had an older brother and an older sister. Maybe they took up a lot of time. I don't know. But it was just kind of like gone. And and when I think back on that, I sometimes in my current iteration, I, I try to, to recapture that. I, I, I think it's a goal. I'm always kind of reaching to see if I can ever find that golden light again. 
I know it's there. And every now and again, I catch a glimpse. But I think like, wow, what was that little girl? What, what was she? What, what was she capable of? But that's okay. So um, not too, too long ago, I was in a women's circle. And these women were going around with the question, where do you come from? And many of these women around the circle were talking about how they came from strong, um, strong women. They came from matriarchy. They came from women who were in charge of many things. And, and I had to say, and not real happily, I had to say, I come from patriarchy. Because that's really all I can remember in terms of who made the rules and who did this and who did that. And, and you know, my mother, uh, not only did she die when I was young, she I think she was just very tired. And so, you know, it wasn't a strong presence of women in my life. So to, to follow up that, when I was like 12 years old, Presbyterian Church, sitting in a confirmation class. Apparently that was a very pivotal thing. So Mm -hmm. one thing happened, and that was um, we were taught, the the topic was was something. And um, I think it was like Jesus in the temple, you know, upturning tables and stuff like that. And And we were talking about the idea that, well, Jesus never sinned. And I go, well, that kind of sounds like a sin because if I turn up tables and get really angry and throw stuff around, then I'm sure going to get in, in trouble because I did a bad thing, you know, something to that effect. And the patriarchal leadership of the world stands there and says, oh, ha, 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 ha. we believe that Jesus was without sin. And I just went zip. And it was like, yeah, well, if you're not going to have any discussion about it, then I'm not going to say anything. And if you're, you know, not going to take any somebody seriously, I mean, that's a pretty serious question. Fair question. I'm not going to have anything to contribute. So that kind of like threw away the key. It's like, well, I'm not going to discuss this anymore. And I was like 12. The other thing that happened, I believe that there was a drawing in that class. It was um, just kind of a little interesting, little personal little exercise, and it was about Mary Magdalene and the demons, right? So I drew this woman, and I drew all these little, like, squirrely, squirrely, um, like, squiggly critters, like, uh, coming out of her or around her. And again, the pastor's like, oh, well, we you know, weren't expecting a piece of art. And it was like, you know, kind of dismissing my efforts, right? However, later, 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 which I'll come to in a few minutes, when I really began my spiritual journey, all of those critters showed up in a dream in my basement. Oh. In a dream, in a basement, I had gone down in there in a dream, because I was having some hard times, and what I found in my own basement, spiritually, were all these little squiggly, squirrely, little colored, striped critters all over the place. And that really began, as an adult, that began a lot of work in terms of clearing that out, clearing those things out. So from 12 years old to 2003, that's how long, you know, those things sat with me. I've always been a church girl. I was a church girl forever. Um, Presbyterian, raised my children Methodist in a different small West Virginia town, married a Lutheran pastor in that other small town, moved to another small town. So, you know, I've always kind of been acclimated and drawn to a church community, but never satisfied with it because I knew that it really wasn't open to discussion. Currently, we uh, are involved with a Unitarian Universalist congregation, and that is like, oh my God, it's like my dreams come true. It's like they, it's multi-faith, 
They have lots of different services. Everything's different all the time. There's lots of discussion, lots of groups, lots of openness. And it's like, thank you. I've waited a long time to be in a congregation, a group of people, a community, spiritually oriented, who were capable of doing this kind of of open having this kind of openness yeah. now is your husband retired or is he a pastor at that unitarian church yeah he's retired when we moved uh from arizona which was it was very much the, the very end of 2019 so january 2020 is a good starting point um that's when he i, I kind of like pulled him out of that scenario so that he would retire because, you know, sometimes pastors just don't want to retire. I don't get <laughs> yeah. it myself. I think that you might want to retire after you've spent a lot of time doing that. So anyway, so um, when I when I think about, you know, my journey, I, there are a couple of very pivotal time frames. And, and 2003 is, is one of them. And uh, we had moved to this other small town, and it happened to be the town where I spent a lot of formative years. I didn't grow up there, but it was where I went to college. It's a great town, a lot of good energy, a lot of music, a lot of great people. And and I had moved, been away from that place for 20 years when I moved back with my Lutheran pastor husband. It, it worked out pretty well. But I did have to um, confront a lot of, like, past um, issues, personal things that were buried for a long time. That would be about the time that dream popped up, 2003. And I had a, a couple of interesting angel encounters. And one of them I really, I really loved. I was, uh, my husband had done some graduate work. So he was working on, it's called a D-Min, a doctor of ministry. And so we had traveled to Chicago for his graduation ceremony. And I was just out of sorts. And I and I don't know exactly why, but it, it was, I don't know. But it was in this place, in this restaurant, and I was just like uncomfortable, didn't want to be in that space. And so I and two little girls went out into like a little courtyard space. And it was just a nice sunshiny day in Chicago somewhere. And we're just, I forget what we were chatting about, or I took these two little girls out because they needed a little bit of run, and I needed to get out of there. So I heard, we're sitting there, and I heard singing coming from like a corner of a building over over there somewhere. And out of this space comes an African-American woman, woman wearing a blue kind of a suit, a gold shirt, and red cowboy boots. And this woman is singing a song, and she's singing something about praises to the king. It was just some song. And she comes over to where we are, and I and these two little girls, we start dancing in the courtyard, in the courtyard. And this woman looks at me and says, do you know how to swim? And I am like, enjoying it, but also going, what is going on here? And it didn't take long for me to kind of absorb the fact that that was um, an otherworldly encounter. No one else saw it. No one else was present, me and two little girls. And the message to me was, can you swim? And the answer was no, I couldn't. So we went back to this little town and I started learning how to swim. It took four months of every day trying to swim, breathe, swim, breathe. At the same time, I was learning how to play guitar. So these are things that I had always wanted for me in my life, but was always too busy, you know, too busy. And I also pretty strongly believe that the swimming stuff with breath regulation and total immersion in water, which is the emotional element of us, that that was uh, an extremely important, it was very formative for me to be able to manage water, 
to be able to make my way through emotions, through water, through sometimes turbulent, you know, emotional things, and also music, learning how to play guitar, learning how to use my voice. These had always been cut off for me. So kind of stepping into these uh, modalities of expression or of being were important. I was also beginning to have these dreams. So their little squirrely creatures in the basement were knocking on my door or on the basement walls, as it were. And so all of these things started getting my attention, getting my attention. I I found some kind of a therapist. Um, It wasn't Reiki, but it did kind of involve some some kind of energy work, but also some talk. And I think I spent about four years working with this particular woman, just trying to kind of sort through the junk that had accumulated over Let's see, it was 2003, so 50, 50 years, you know, of, of junk, which is a while, you know. So um, I was, um, in, in 2009, I began my Reiki journey, and that just kind of happened. I'd had a couple of Reiki sessions with a friend who I'd always considered very woo-woo, she was always kind of out there with lots of different things, which I really liked. However, I knew that it was kind of woo-woo. And so I was like, yeah, she's a good friend, and I like her, and I you know, will go to these Reiki sessions. And they were very interesting. Some very strong things happened, and that was good. So another friend said, oh, there's a Reiki retreat up in um, – It was upstate New York. It was around Lake George, not where the uh, Northeast Reiki Retreat is now. It was some other place. And so uh, she and I, my friend and I, went up there, and my basic consideration was, are these Reiki people going to be too woo-woo for me? Because I really needed, I couldn't handle it. When If somebody would come up to me, and I had this experience a couple of times, and go, oh, well, the reason your knee hurts is because in a past life, they cut off your leg. And it's like, I just like can't handle it. I, I just can't yeah. handle it. And I had a few of those experiences, and I went like, yeah, whatever. So um, I'm out of that one anyway. So I, it has to be a little bit grounded for me. And and this does not mean that I don't have you know my own woo-woo-ness, but I also try to, to keep it um, – I like to be, hmm, how shall I say this? I like to be kind of acceptable in certain mainstream realities because I think many people can talk about it if it's kept in those kind of boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so part of my goal as we go further about studying the fascial structure and how it operates is to bring that, kind of woo-woo, intuitive, oh, they're talking to me kind of thing, to bring that into a situation where it has uh, a certain amount of grounding in human, uh, it's even even science. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't want to have to, you know, be all scientific about it, but it is grounded in physics and quantum physics and biology and some other things, which we'll get to a little bit later, I'm sure. So 2009, I went to this Reiki retreat, and these people were teachers, social workers. They were um, massage therapists. They were lovely. They were great, 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 great people. And I went, oh, great, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn Reiki then. This is for me. And so I went home, and I went to the woman, my friend, my woo-woo friend, and I said, you have to teach me because I'm not going to go to anybody else. You're my friend. I love you. I want you to teach me. And so she did. And it took a while. She was um, very thorough. She gave me a lot of notes and notebook. And it took probably, well, it was probably from September to the winter to do like a Reiki 1 and 2 And then she wouldn't do another class for about another year. 
So a lot of practicing and she, and she made me, you know, we practiced and practiced and practiced. It, it was great. And then I went to the next year to that same Reiki retreat and it was, um, it was good. I felt like I was part of what it was. Um, I was, I would say that my awareness of Reiki and energy practices grew, you know, slowly. I was still working. I was an elementary school counselor. I was doing some other things. And, um, about around about 2012, I had the the kind of very opening experience, and it was a woman from this church that we were at, and she had had a, a really bad um, spiral fracture of her lower leg and into the ankle. She, it was a bad one, and they were really questioning, you know, how much damage control they were going to have to do with this thing. So Fred, being the pastor, went to visit this couple, and I went along because I liked them. I didn't really know them well. So this woman, Susan, is sitting on the couch with this big pink cast stuck out, you know, like resting straight out from the sofa. And I keep looking at this cast and looking at this cast, and I want to touch it, and I want to touch it, and I'm holding myself back, and I'm holding myself back, and I want to, you know, put my hands on it. And finally, I just I couldn't re- do it, couldn't resist it anymore, and I put my hands on the cast, and she said, ah! and I went, oh, crap, now. <laughs> but she goes, oh, I know what you're doing. She was a southern girl. I know what you're doing. You're doing Reiki. And I said, yes, this is Reiki. And so we talked, and then we set up pretty much at least once a week, maybe a couple times a week for, like, throughout that whole summer. And we had some incredible experiences. She was very energy aware. She didn't want to do Reiki. She had no desire to learn anything about it, but she could feel, like, everything that was going on. And one time when her ankle was healing, she had a boot on and I had my hands, well, I probably took the boot off, but I had my hands like on that area where that had been spirally fractured. And I could feel things inside twisting back into the places they were supposed to be. And she's going, I can feel that twisting in there. And I'm going, me too. <laughs> so we kind of hung with that for a while. And it was, like, bizarre and very, very real. And so that was probably the determining moment when I say to myself, I say, this is more real than anything else I have ever experienced. This is reality. And it just kept keeps on going from there. And you just, you learn more, you take more classes, you go to more, you meet more people, you go to retreats, you do this, you do that. And you just keep on growing in that, in that relationship of um, the energetic nature of ourselves, the energetic nature of the universe, um, energy awareness. And it is, um, if you want to be biblical about it, which I'm okay with. I kind of liked it when I was in it. I'm not in it so much anymore, biblical stuff. But there's a little parable in there when um, Jesus tells the story of the man who found a field. And in that field, there was gold and there was treasure buried in the field. And so the man went out and sold everything that he had and he bought the field of treasure. And it's like, This is a field of treasure. This is what is. This is what we are. This is what we want. This is what, when we find it, this is what we hang on to. And so I'll I'll stick with that part of the story. (laughs) Okay. Along about this time, if you want to know even more, I don't know how much of this you need to know. I'll keep going. Keep going. So I... Yeah, I also uh, moved very deeply into an exploration, and um, uh, I have studied more since, 
but an exploration and a realization and an, an internal awareness or an acceptance of divine feminine. When I say, you know, I come from patriarchy, there are like about a bazillion anger issues that are associated with that. And perhaps you can understand. Many people will understand. Some people won't. But they were huge. They were massive. And they were all mine. But I think I share them with lots of people. So I worked through a lot of anger. There's, remember those little squirrely creatures, those squigglies? Anger, resentment, jealousy, rung, 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 being treated that way, rung, 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 rung. Why can't I? Rung, 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 yeah. rung, 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 All that stuff. That victim and, and mentality. <laughs> pardon? That victim oh. mentality. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of victimization in being a woman in yeah. for about the last 5,000 years. So anyway, so into the divine feminine and then kind of learning to embrace that as a, a part of me for sure and then also part of the reality of, of what goes on around us, that there is a, a – it's a very real and very – uh, important energy that has been dismissed for a very long time. Yeah. And it's a ri- it is rising, it is becoming more prevalent, it is growing, and my personal belief is that this is where we're going. In, in our world, we are moving back to the feminine divine or into the feminine divine. And then what I would also say is in partnership with the masculine divine. So, you know, yin yang takes right. both. It takes all, it takes it all. It's all here. Yeah. So, that's that. Okay, a couple questions. Okay. If you're ready for the questions. <laughs> and I because you're on video, I see this angel behind you. And it looks like a combination of angel and the divine feminine. Uh, So, uh, and you mentioned that you had a a couple encounters with angels and you told us about one. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are... Can you talk about another one or, you know, something else? Yeah, that's I, there's one more that, that I would, that I am able to describe. I think I've probably had more, but these two are the most outstanding ones. And this has to do, the, the first one was, can you swim? And the second one was about music. It was about playing the guitar and singing. And I've struggled with my, you know, trying to have a, a real voice for years. And it's, you know, it has to do with the Women will understand the being cut off frequently kind of thing happens. So um, it was in a bar, and this was in that town where I had a lot of college experiences, but this was 20 years later. And this was a great place to be. There was always music. There were always local musicians. They had an open mic. And I was really, you know, working hard to learn how to play guitar and to, and I don't know if I had done the open mic before this particular experience, but it was really like, you know, well, am I going to do this? Am I not going to do it? Is it, can I do it? Can, am I just not good enough to do it? You know, all of that kind of stuff. And so I was in this bar, I was sitting pretty much by myself right in front of where people play and a woman, n- nobody knew this woman. She was not part of this community. She was tall and kind of strong and had very, 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 very curly hair. And she sat down in that chair, and she starts strumming that guitar, and I do not even know what was coming out of her vocally, but it was intense, and it was a lot. And I felt like I was encapsulated in some kind of a little force field. I sure wasn't going to move. And I also felt like nobody else in the place was aware of it. Everybody was talking and chatting and da 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 da, and I was I felt like I was the only person who was like aware of this woman. And when she was done, she got up, 
She walked to the back room to put her guitar in her case, and and she walked back through the room where people were sitting, and she, I don't know if she touched me, I don't know if she, but she, she spoke to me, and she said, it was either don't stop playing or keep on playing. And she was gone. And so I keep trying. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah, great. It's kind of cool. I mean, yeah. They were good for me. I mean, I, I, I think angel encounters are fabulous. Yeah. And I'd love if, if those are mine, you know, that they are a little quirky. The cowboy boots, the red cowboy boots were awesome. <laughs> And, uh, and then this yeah. woman, I mean, I, I don't think anybody even knew she was in the room. Yeah. And, and it was just a trance. It was like a, a fixation. Yeah. It was it was bizarro, too. But it was lovely. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm very interested in relationships. And I'm curious about this transformation that you went through while married to a Lutheran minister uh, and how accepting he was or not accepting of some of the things that, you know, you've described as woo-woo because if they were woo-woo to you when you first got introduced to them, was he looking at you a little askance about, okay, what's happening to my wife here? Um, I don't know if it was so much of, of that, is, but he, he is accepting. He's not particularly interested in terms of his own involvement. I did, um, when we were in Arizona, I did encourage him to go to up to Sedona to Peace Place to Michael and Laurel, Laurel Guy and Michael Baird, and take the um, Reiki 1 2 class that they offered up there. Because I felt like, um, because I was becoming more, you know, so much more immersed in it, that he should know a little bit more about it. So he did that. Um, it's not something that he wants to do. He has mm -hmm. gained benefit from it off and on with, you know, some injuries and whatnot. But you also kind of get to the place where, you know, it's here. You All you have to do is ask. Yeah. But then, at the, and so I don't get that a lot sometimes. But at the same time, I figure, well, we're living in the same house. We're sleeping in the same bed. So I think there's some osmosis going on there. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so I, I'm okay with that. So um, I will say that when I went through the... Um, releasing a lot of the anger uh, it was kind of a, a big thing and I give him huge credit for listening and not responding yeah. and just allowing this to kind of and that was that's probably that was a huge gift because if he had tried to counter it or discuss it or anything other than just let me let me let him have it. Uh, it would it would have been a lot different story. Yeah. So I remember it distinctly. It was just like, like you know, a lot of years worth of bottled up junk. Right. And he was able to, you know, he was able to just let that happen. And I appreciate that hugely. So. Yeah, because uh, you know the. The conversation typically is that women tend to marry their fathers. And if you were raised in a very patriarchal household, yeah. that you may have ended up in a similar situation with your marriage. But it, it yeah. sounds like that's it's worked out okay. It has worked out. I'm going to say that it is still patriarchal. And then I have a son who's rather patriarchal. And I have... Oh, let's see, five, six grandsons. So I, I think that that it's something that I am simply placed here in order to um, uh. work with, and I don't know how else to, you know, I don't know how else to deal with it. Yeah. It's just I am surrounded by it. I am in it. 
I come from patriarchy. I'm in it. And so if indeed we are moving into a new world, and I do believe that we are, then part of my role in this is to help move through the patriarchal constructs Mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. I don't know. I I hate to say I'm making that up, but I don't know (laughs) what else to say about it because sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes I get really, really frustrated like yesterday. And, um, and then I kind of have to, you know, do my own work and I have to move in there and kind of deal with, with the me that's in there because, you know, it's all, anything that's going to happen is going to happen here and then move itself outward from here. So they are, I hate, I hate to give, I hate to tell them that they're my teachers. I don't want to tell them that, but (laughs) You're going to reinforce I, the whole system. <laughs> I know I'm not doing that. I'm not reinforcing it, but I, I do have to frequently, you know, kind of figure out a way to move into it so that my vision, my will can be uh, set along right. with. And then most of the time I pay really good attention to this stuff too, because it is like a big deal. And so most of the time, things come together well. Yeah. Yeah. So when I met you, uh, I guess I was extremely impressed, as well as was most of the audience, when you did your presentation. Uh, And I took so many notes that I was able to then give a presentation based on your presentation to a spiritual group that that I belong to. Uh, And they were fascinated enough that they asked me to come back and do a little more and answer some more questions. Uh, So I had to do a lot of research on my own (laughs) at that point. Uh, I can help you out with that, I'm pretty sure. But I I understand. Yeah, I can help you out with that. Yeah. I understand you're going to do a part two this this coming May at the Northeast Reiki Retreat, so I'm, yes. I'm very much yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But could you share with our audience a little bit about what this is all about? Yes, absolutely, yeah. So first of all, um, I had to get a little bit of help with an elevator speech because I, I was sharing my presentation with a Reiki friend, and she and I'm going like, okay, this is you know the fascinating world of fascia. And she goes, what is fascia? And and that's the basic question. So the elevator speech goes like this. And I have my notes in front of me because I want to get it right. Okay. So the fascia is the good stuff inside of us. It is all of the connective tissue of our bodies. It reaches into every cell of our bodies. Not only does it give our bodies structure and shape, it also serves as a communication system both within the body and outside of the body, beyond the body, let us say, and that is what it is. That's the elevator speech. So beyond the elevator speech, then we start to talk about, you know, well, what is this stuff? And, um, one, to me, one of the most interesting things about it, it, it is still not common knowledge. And it is amazing to me, like in a room full of high-end Reiki practitioners, energy workers, people really don't know what's going on with it. Right. So to me, it's a very exciting exploration because it really, there are a lot of connections that really have not been made yet. A lot of it is science. A lot of it is woo-woo. And it's like pretty much the interface. Let's call it the interface between science and woo-woo. <laughs> okay. That might be the not might be the next working title. I don't know. So we'll we'll see about that. But um, what happens is that we are familiar with what is fascia when we work with meat because it is a, a function of like human animalia, let's say, or or any animalia 
mammals have it, reptiles have some, they all, everybody has it, right? Every living, breathing creature has it. So it is all of the connective tissue, which does include, it's all the ligaments, tendons, it does also include bones, and it does include stuff like blood, but we tend to focus on the stuff that holds our bones together. People are familiar with tendons and ligaments. Some people are familiar with, like, there's a, a, a coating on the bone. It's, it's called um, osteo, mm, I'm not going to remember the actual name. It's very biology-based stuff. So sometimes I get a little, I have to have some notes in front of yeah. me about terminologies. But the idea is that if you are cutting beef or chicken or deer meat, and if you're in a hunting culture, then you're probably very familiar with deer meat. So when you take the muscles apart, when you're taking the meat apart and putting it, cutting it into sections, you're dissecting it or you're going to cook it, whatever, there's the white stringy stuff that you see that's in between muscles, in between layers of muscles, and you can pull that stuff out. We used to call it sheathing, like with deer meat. I yeah. grew up with a lot of that. So sheathing, and, and they also called it silver skin in deer meat, which I think is a very cool term for it. But it can be very tough, or it can be very like gelatinous when you're talking about chicken skin and underneath mm -hmm. the skin and whatnot. And all of that stuff is the connective tissue. Well, when we're living creatures, the connective tissue is very much alive also. But when the life has gone out and you're cutting up uh, beef, deer, chicken, then you're going to take that stuff and you're going to throw it away because it's kind of, you know, chewy or whatever. So the reality of the fascial structure of the human body is that historically, when medical people have been dissecting anatomists, figuring out, oh, I want to see what that muscle does. Oh, I want to see what that thing does there. Oh, I want to look at the kidney. Oh, I want to look at that. They essentially would take the fascia. What is that stuff? What's that stuff around it? I don't know. Get it out of the way. They would take that fascia connective tissue and throw it away. So there was not any clear understanding of the role of fascia other than holding bones to muscles, muscles to bones, ligaments, tendons, other than, other than that, and like a, you know, the sports understanding of how things work, because, of course, it's all about the muscles, right? When in reality, it is the fascia that is holding absolutely everything. If you were to dissolve everything in the body except the fascial system, you could hold up a, you could call it a leotard or a unitard because it is going to exist from the top of your head all the way to your toes. And it's going to be one inseparable piece of fascial fabric. It is an interconnected web. It is like the web of life. In Native American understanding, it's the web of life that we walk around in our human bodies, and then it's also the web of life that connects us with the world around us because this fascial system in addition to giving our body structure and shape, which is very important in terms of like Reiki and energy healing, where does it hurt, for example, or where's the where are you holding something? Where are you, you know, where's this landing in your body? Where are we going to work on this? It also has this amazing capability for communication, internal communication, which is called interoception, one of my favorite words, because if you're really clear on the inside, you can figure out where things are located, where that anger is sitting, where those difficult emotions, 
where that trauma is being held. You can, with some work, practice, figure that out. But also, this energetic capability that is housed in the fossil system extends outward beyond. I'm going to think that most of your audience has awareness of the energetic field of a human body, all living beings, including plants, trees, etc., carry an energetic body because anything that has vibratory qualities emits a field. So when I was a counselor and I worked with this with some students at school, I would go, oh, you know that when they call that personal space that exists about three feet around you and you, you, you know, you're, you are allowed to tell people to get out of your personal space. That's pretty much the extension of our energetic field that is inhabited or populated by energies that we refer to in terms of their being generated by the chakra system. And I'm, again, kind of assuming a set of knowledge here with you and your your audience that there is a certain amount of understanding of these, you know, energetic selves that we all have. We, we, most of us experience the idea of like, if you're in a crowded room, but you know, somebody's like looking at you across the room, you're like looking backward to see who's like checking you out or something. That is that energetic system extending beyond your personal energetic field and then interfacing or being approached by someone else's directed energy intention. So all of this has to do with quantum. All of this has to do with the idea that energy, that matter is energy. Energy condenses itself into matter to form what we call the world around us and the tactiles. And that's the kind of science that this is heavily, heavily based on. Mm -hmm. And quantum, you know, wasn't part of, wasn't part of vocabulary until not too, too long ago. Now, you know, people, oh, yeah, I got that quantum thing going on. I mean, it's a little more available. But then the nuts and bolts of quantum or the lights and waves of quantum are a little harder to kind of discern. When we talk about things like, well, when we talk about energy modalities, when we talk about working with crystals, when we talk about vibrational therapies, when we talk about sound therapy, all of that is creating waves of energy. A Reiki practitioner basically sets, is trained to set herself as a clear channel so that the healing energies of Reiki may move through, through me, my channel, to you for your highest and best good. So that's the, you know, opening oneself to these other vibrations of light and love and then offering those vibrations in a Reiki session to a client on the table. Vibrationally, it might be a little easier to understand it vibrationally, tuning forks, um, sound. I have two crystal bowls behind me, crystal bowls, because we can we tend to be able to feel that a little more. Not that people don't feel Reiki, but it's a, perhaps a little more subtle. But I have worked with tuning forks with a lot of people and people who are really bound up and really kind of tight in their world. I can put the tuning fork on their shoulder and they go, I don't, I don't feel anything. I might feel it right there, but I don't feel anything else. All I have to do is hold the tuning fork and it's running through my whole body. Yeah. And it's not running through my muscles specifically. It's not running through my blood specifically it's not running through my neural system it's running through my fascial network right. which is highly attuned to heat pressure and vibration you have a question okay <laughs> uh that's that's to 
pique our audience's interest and maybe give them some information that they didn't have before. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing the the advanced <laughs> talk yeah. that, that you plan yeah. to give in May. Uh, yeah, okay. Are you trying to tell me that we're just about out of time? We are just about out of okay. time. All right. All right, so let me hand you a couple of lovely little pieces of information. Uh, the key to the fascial system is the breath. And it has to do with sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous systems and the connections that are very deeply, deeply interconnected, making this magnificent um, net, I guess, network, this web, this, this connection that is deeply interior in our beings. It does connect with our instinct, the subconscious. It, it connects with all kinds of stuff. And when you breathe, when you breathe and you follow the exhale, the key is to follow the exhale. And at some point, if you're following that exhale deeply, you will find a level of relaxation. And it will feel like something hmm, like water running down your legs, out your feet. That is the key to this. If you can feel on the inside, when you exhale slowly, take your time, meditation is key to meditation as well. And when you can feel that interior kind of start to, it's kind of like a little buzzy feeling, a little tingly feeling, when you can feel that on the inside, that is the activation of your fascial system throughout the body. First of all, it's a relaxation response. And then if you're following that more deeply, like into, the, into a meditative process, it is the fascial system then that is carrying you into that depth. It's, you've turned off your mind. You're working on the fascial system you are accessing its capabilities that we don't frequently access. You feel it moving through your body, and perhaps you begin to receive images. You begin in meditation. Perhaps you have some intuitive voices that are coming your way, and those pieces of communication are coming to you through your fascial system as a little teaser for you for <laughs> may one of the focuses of what i just am just have to find out more about is the function of the pineal pineal gland yeah. how that how that sits in operation with the fascial system because yeah. that is our third eye that's our, our visioning center and so how the visioning comes from comes to us from beyond how it then becomes processed through and chakras are part of this energetic centers and then how they transmit through the rest of our being there is so much more it's okay. a fascinating world well i wouldn't dare miss the may northeast reiki retreat that's coming up yeah, so, I'm going to have a workshop. Um, I think it might be on Thursday afternoon, uh -huh. and uh, and in that I want to explore even more deeply. There's also a very deep strand of this that what I find in all my research is that pretty much everybody who's working with this kind of like uh, the intuitive, the fascial, the light body is the other part of it. They, it goes back into very ancient practices. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm very, uh, I want to set that out. I want to kind of clarify that for myself and others, that connection, and then bring it forward. Mm -hmm. When I talked about people throwing it away, they threw it away. There were a lot of people writing about uh, crystal bodies and light action and intuitive and uh even homeopathic is like an energy medicine. So they were writing about it a lot in the 80s. Nobody mentions fascia, not one. Even the high, high end of these people, they do not mention fascia. It's not until the 2000s that you even get the first name of it 
and then 2016, you have a little bit more description of it, et cetera. So it's coming along in terms of our awareness. And um, what I like to call fascia is the organ of awareness because it's an organ, you know, like skin yeah. is an organ. And, um, and it is, it is the part of us, the physical part of it, the, the human beingness of us that carries our awareness, yeah. both internally and externally. So we just have about two minutes okay. for any words of wisdom that you would like to leave with our audience. Yeah, um, I think, you know, the, the breath is the key. And so the other part of it is, is kind of practicing that awareness. Pretend that, because it's real, but you got to start by pretending, right? Pretend that anytime you touch a person's shoulder, hand, kindness, any thought that you put out to another person, that touch or that thought or that intention is emanating out through your body, through your field, and it is resonating in, you see my hands out here somewhere, yeah. <laughs> resonating like um, like the ripples. And I listened to John and Heidi last night, the ripple effect. It is very much like that. Yeah. So when you are sending kindness, compassion, light, love through your system, which is built to do this, then you are helping wherever you are. I think it might have something to do with that golden light that I <laughs> that I had trouble with when I was four years old, but I'm pretty sure there's golden light here involved too. Yeah. So yeah. So just find that, just watch that, see it. Watch another person soften. Watch somebody just kind of like lean not lean into you, but kind of gravitate to you because the resonance of the highest vibrations of light and love are the resonance vibrations that bring the goodness. You send it out, and it comes back to you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I feel like we could go on for another hour. but Un Unfortunately, uh, there's just so much. It's yeah. an amazing thing. If you want to do it again, you're just going to have to let me know. Okay. Okay. Thank so. you so much. Audience, as you know, you've you've heard a lot. Uh, there's a lot to take in here, so just take what resonates with you, put the rest on a shelf, and when you're ready to bring it down off that shelf, it'll be waiting for you. Yeah. It'll be in a basket, right? <laughs> a basket made of pine needles. That's it. So until okay. next time, this has been your spiritual journey.